Hi all, today we're going to discuss the first part of the chapter 8 of Introduction to Philosophy of Technology, entitled From Robotics and AI to Thinking about Moral Status and Human Relationships. Let's begin by thinking about a technological advancement, self-driving cars. Self-driving cars raise ethical questions. For example, if there is a situation in which the car has to choose between saving the life of the driver or saving the life of a pedestrian, what choice should it make and how should it make that choice? Should engineers and computer scientists make moral machines that have their own morality? As is the case with self-driving cars, New developments in robotics and artificial intelligence raise philosophical questions with regard to a moral standing of these machines. Think about computers or robots that can win difficult games, can automatically trade or even execute lethal military actions, are able to engage in a conversation with you, can drive you to work, invite you to have sex with them, or can serve as personal assistants or artificial pets in the family. From an ethical point of view, do we want these robots or AI systems? What if the decisions and actions they take are unethical? Can robots be held responsible? Can machines have a morality? And what if our interaction with them is unethical? What kind of ethics do we need to interact with them? Kuckelberg uses the distinction between moral agency and moral patiency to order the ethical questions regarding robots and AI systems. Moral agency is the capacity of an entity to act and comport morally toward other entities. Moral patiency is the capacity of the entity to be the object of such moral acts or compartment. As machines become smarter and more autonomous, they become capable of taking over tasks usually done by humans, such as driving a car or using a weapon to kill, autonomous lethal weapons. This raises the following questions regarding the moral agency of machines. Should we delegate this task to them, given that they seem to lack full moral agency? Or is this a bias against machines? Can they have moral agency? Are our criteria of moral agency too human-like? Can these machines be developed with a built-in morality, a machine morality? Or is this impossible? What does morality mean? Some questions regarding the moral patiency of machines are the following. As machines become more lifelike, often human-like or animal-like in their appearance and behavior, do we do anything wrong when we mistreat them, abuse them? Do they have a moral status at all, and if so, which one? For example, is it okay to kick a robot? Is it fine to do whatever one wants with a sex robot? Are they mere machines, or are they more than machines? And even if we will decide that they deserve some moral consideration, should we give them rights? And if so, under what conditions or according to what criteria? How do we decide on moral status anyway? Why do humans have a high moral status? Let's start with a discussion about moral agency. Do moral machines exist? Positions regarding machines' moral agency. The following positions have been defended. First, machines can be full moral agents in the same way as humans are full moral agents. Second, machines cannot be full moral agents, but we can give them a limited kind of morality or functional morality. Third, machines can be full moral agents, but not in the same way as humans are full moral agents. Fourth, machines can never be moral agents at all. First, machines can be full moral agents in the same way as humans. This position rests on the assumption that we can know what human morality is, formalize it, and build it in into a machine. 
or that we can build an artificial system that will itself learn human morality. This position often goes together with the idea that morality is a matter of rule following. An example is the so-called laws of robotics introduced in Isaac Asimov's science fiction stories. First law, a robot may not injure a human being, or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Second law, a robot must obey any orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders will conflict with the first law. Third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Problems with morality based on rules There are problems with the implementation of moral rules. For example, in the case of a self-driving car, the issue is how it will deal with dilemmas such as this. If the rule is a robot may not injure a human being, should the car avoid a child crossing the road and drive into a wall, killing the driver, or rather kill the child? This is an example of what philosophers call trolley dilemma issues, named after thought experiments that present a choice between options that all have morally bad consequences. The original trolley dilemma states that a trolley whirls down a railway track and you can choose between doing nothing and letting the trolley kill five people tied to a crack or pulling a lever and send the trolley to another track on which one person is tied. What if the protagonist of this story is a robot or an AI? What kind of moral rules and artificial intelligence can help here? What will you do? What should a human do? A version of the first position argues that machines can have a human kind of morality. In contemporary robotics, there are researchers who try to build moral principles and moral reasoning into robots to deal with ethical problems. While they admit that morality cannot be reduced to a couple of simple rules and that not all ethicists agree on everything, they claim that in principle, it is possible to give machines a human kind of morality. Michael and Susan Anderson hold this position. They think that it is the ultimate aim of machine ethics to create what James Moore called explicit ethical agents. Perhaps not full ethical agents in the metaphysical sense, since machines lack consciousness, but they come close enough to how humans make ethical decisions. These authors assume that ethics can be made computable. We can give machines a set of principles. Given that for them ethics is a matter of rationality, Anderson and Anderson know that machines may, be, may even be superior when it comes to ethics, since human beings often get carried away by their emotions. There are several problems with this rationalistic approach. The main objection is that its assumptions about ethics and morality are fundamentally flawed. Ethics cannot and should not be reduced to following rules and principle, and is not entirely a matter of rationality, but also involves emotions and should involve emotions. The point is that even if a human being will be that kind of moral agent, they will not be a full moral agent at all. Taking into account work that sees emotions as indispensable for moral judgment, Kugelberg argues that when it comes to ethics, such rule-following robots will be psychopathic robots, which will be dangerous since they will lack full moral agency. The second position states that machines can have a functional morality but no full moral agency. This position tries to wield ethical considerations into machines, but does not claim that this amounts to full moral agency. Wallach and Allen have argued that limited systems with some capacity to evaluate the ethical ramifications of their actions will soon be built. They call this functional morality. The machines have the capacity for assessing and responding to moral challenges. 
and some ethical sensitivity, but they are not full moral agents. The point is that it is still better to have systems like this than no building ethics at all. We need to build systems that can behave as ethically as possible. The third position advocates for a non-anthropocentric view of moral agency. The first and second position still hold on to the idea that, ideally, morality needs to be human-like and start from human morality. An alternative response to a problem with regard to a gap between machine moral agency and human moral agency is to argue that one can and should use different criteria for moral agency. Flaherty and Sanders have argued that moral agents do not necessarily have to exhibit free will, mental states, or responsibility. They focus on what they call a mindless morality. If we have a sufficiently interactive, autonomous, and adaptive entity, in other words, an agent, then moral agency depends on whether the agent is capable of morally qualifiable action. For example, according to this approach, a dog can be an agent playing a key role in a moral situation such as search and rescue and is therefore a moral agent, even if it is not morally responsible. And a web bot can also be a moral agent if it correctly filters out many messages. Ethics, Flaherty and Sanders argue, lies not exclusively within the human domain. They thus propose to analyze the behavior of entities in what they claim to be a non-anthropocentric way, and extend the class of agents and moral agents. Building on this account, John Solins has argued that it is not necessary for robots to have personhood to qualify as moral agents. Solins sees three requirements for full moral agency and even moral responsibility. First, autonomy. The robot is significantly autonomous from any programmers or operators. Second, intention. One can analyze or explain the robot's behavior only by ascribing some predisposition or intention to good or harm. Third, responsibility. The robot behaves in a way that shows an understanding of responsibility to some other moral agent. Problems with non-anthropocentric moral agency. Against the third position, it could be objected that these arguments confuse moral relevance of actions with moral agency. It is one thing to recognize that such animals and robots do morally relevant things, it is another to say that they therefore have moral agency, which, so this argument goes, only person or humans can have. For example, Deborah Johnson has argued that computer systems can be moral entities but not moral agents. They are produced and used by humans. And while they have intentionality, this intentionality is always linked to those of humans, and they do not have moral agency of their own. That is impossible since they do not have mental state, and if they did, they do not have intendings to act, which arise from an agent's freedom. Ultimately, this debate seems to depend on whether one believes that moral agency is intrinsically connected to personhood or humanness. Now the discussion about moral patience. Robots, or any other entity for that matter, can not only be seen as potentially doing something in a moral situation, they can be the agent, they can also be on the receiving end of such an action, they can be the patient. How should we morally respond to robots? The questions regarding the moral patiency of machines are especially relevant with regard to so-called social robotics, which aims at building social and interactive robots that live and work with humans in everyday contexts such as the household or the workplace. Such robots are intentionally designed to act in a human-like way, such that interacting with it is like interacting with another person. The starting point of this kind of investigation is the perhaps puzzling fact that many people respond to robots in ways that go beyond seeing the robot as a mere machine. 
they empathize with the robot, care about the robot, and care for the robot. Consider, for instance, the case of a robot dog called Spot. You can see it on the left of your screen. That was kicked by its designers to test its capabilities to stabilize itself. Some people reacted with moral disapproval or even indignation, exclaiming phrases such as, Poor Spot! Seriously, Boston Dynamics, stop kicking those poor robots. What did they ever do to you? Kicking a dog, even a robot dog, just seems wrong. How can we understand these intuitions and responses? How can we address this issue from a philosophical perspective? One way to start doing this is to ask the question concerning moral standing. There are again a number of positions available. First, robots have no moral standing. Our intuition and responses that suggest that the robot is more than a thing are entirely wrong. Robots are just machines, and we do not owe any moral consideration to them. Second, robots have a weak form of moral standing. We do not have direct duties to robots, but indirect duties. This is a Kantian argument. Or we should treat robots well if we want to be virtuous. This is a virtue ethics argument, and direct arguments for moral standing. Third, a strong version. Current robots have moral standing, including perhaps rights, or at least in principle and maybe in the future, they can have moral standing. Fourth, we are asking the wrong kind of questions and should approach the question of moral patiency differently and more critically. This last position will be explained in the next lecture about this topic. First, it is wrong to ascribe any moral standing to machines. Machines are things, not people. They are not moral patients in any sense. The difficulty with this position is that it neither explains nor justifies moral intuitions that there may be something wrong with, for example, torturing a robot. Second position, robots have a weak form of moral standing. An attempt to justify this intuition that there may be something wrong with mistreating a robot is offered by Kantian and virtue ethics arguments. Kant argued we have indirect duties towards animals, since mistreating them make us unkind and hard towards humans. Kant wrote that the person who kills an animal damages the kindly and humane qualities in himself which he ought to exercise in virtue of his duties to mankind, for a person who already displays such cruelty to animals is also no less hardened towards people. Now this argument can and has been applied to robots. As Darling has argued, its logic extends to robotic companions. If we treat robots in inhumane ways, we become inhumane persons. Kukulber has constructed a similar argument based on virtue ethics. According to this argument, mistreating a robot is not morally wrong because of the robot being harmed, but because doing so repeatedly and habitually shapes the wrong kind of moral character. The problem then is not a violation of duty or morally bad consequences for the robot, but a problem of human character and virtue. Thus, treating robots well is a virtue, not doing so is a vice. The problem with this approach, however, is that the full load of moral concerns is on the humans, which those who defend at least some moral standing of robots find objectionable. Third position, robots have moral standing. What could be arguments for giving robots moral standing as patients? There are at least three possibilities. First, traditional arguments for moral standing. Second, non-anthropocentric argument. Third, social relational arguments. First, traditional arguments for moral patiency require that entities have sentience, personhood, consciousness, the ability to suffer, or other futures we usually associate with humans as moral patients. 
if a robot were to have these features, we will have to give them high moral standing, similar to a moral standing we give to humans. A problem with this argument is that we can never be entirely sure if and what an entity experiences. Even, even the human case is not a straightforward. Do we really know what is in the head of another person? The first approach just described is entirely anthropocentric. It takes human futures as the only sufficient conditions for moral standing. In response, one could construct a non-anthropocentric argument with a lower threshold and non-anthropocentric criteria that can be measured such as autonomy and interactivity. One could give some degree of moral patience to machines. One could argue that now or in the future, we may recognize some robots as having a specific degree of moral patience, which is likely to be lower than that of humans. Thank you for watching. That was all for today. I will post tomorrow the second part of this lecture about ethics of robotics and ethics of AI. Have a good day.